<clears throat> so uh, I thought that we, we may continue actually with this topic of taking lessons from other industries. And because uh, recently I also became a private pilot and uh, doing my instrument rating currently, um, I have learned a lot of interesting lessons from aviation. And I thought that I might want to share with you a little bit uh, about that. Uh, so this is me at the top in my plane. And uh, you see the, the, the typical glass cockpit that uh, is in most of the modern planes, where there is a very high level of automation. On the right, you can see the, the human interface of the autopilot, which is just small part of that automation that you find in modern aircrafts. Um, <clears throat> actually, there are surprisingly a number of, of topics that are common between aviation and pharmacovigilance. It's also very highly regulated and complex environment. Uh, lives are at stake. Uh, so it's a high priority, high risk industry. There is existing global regulations and standards actually with a great um, history as well. There is a very intensive international collaboration, mutual recognition, and there are international treaties. It's actually a much stronger than pharmacovigilance for obvious reasons, when you are in a high-speed aircraft, one state is need, not really where you can stay. So when you are actually flying over multiple states in just a matter of minutes, <clears throat> then obviously there needs to be an international harmonization of the rules. Uh, safety first is a very important principle, and pretty much modern aviation, pretty much everything is done with that in mind. Uh, which is also common with pharmacovigilance. <clears throat> it is recognized high risk industry with very long experience with risk management. And I would say risk management is really advanced and we can um, perhaps have a separate talk about the methodologies of risk management used in aviation. Uh, it, it has a recognized significant role of human factors, which we are still uh, at the journey of appreciating in our industry. Um, and uh, also understanding that actually human factors determine the safety outcomes in most of the situations. Uh, early introduction of automation to minimize human errors and increase efficiency. So that was the original um, kind of motivation. Also, the, the increasing efficiency is, of course, a business imperative, but also minimizing the human errors for the acceptance of the overall industry. And uh, early in the aviation, human errors were main uh, resource of, uh, of the fatal accidents. Uh, today, it's also more and more automation uh, to blame. Um, there is a recognized group of new errors stemming from that human-machine interaction. So in, in many of those investigations, you can read that it was actually about the interaction between human and a machine. Uh, so not just machine to blame or the pilot to blame, but it was the interaction that was wrong. Uh, there is quite open communication culture allowing learning from errors. So no blame culture also called in patient safety like that. And it's very advanced safety communication. So people have uh, developed many formal and less formal uh, communication channels to exchange the learnings that increase the safety. Um, Rule-based automation is widely implemented for many years now. This is a, a recent example from Boeing 737 MAX. Pretty much everybody is aware of what happened uh, with this aircraft. You can see the, this uh, schema of uh, maneuvering um, characteristics augmentation system, <clears throat> which is uh, a new system that was introduced without the proper communication to pilot. Uh, to this to this new uh, airplane and uh, approved by the FAA uh, and uh, through mutual recognition then uh, basically approved worldwide uh, which led to the fatal accidents because it was supposed to help to uh, prevent stalls but actually it did not work that well it worked quite the opposite <clears throat> it uh, put the aircraft down too much with that. It, it didn't stop that automation didn't stop as it was uh, designed to stop and um, uh, the angle of attack sensors the uh, the airspeed sensors and other sensors um, uh, did not actually uh, communicate it correctly to the flight computers and uh, despite multiple efforts 
from pilots to override this automation, eventually these two uh, airliners crashed and killed 346 people. You can watch the full video about the, uh, uh, the analysis of these accidents. Uh, you can read thousands of pages about this. Again, this is really uh, open culture. All the errors have been discussed in great level of details. It's fascinating reading and it's, um, uh, it's emotional difficult. Uh, just imagine what's happening when you are fighting the computer as a pilot and you just cannot win. Uh, so obviously, uh, one of uh, there were many issues linked with that. Industry whistleblowers brought to light the issue that insufficient training and improper certification of FAA aviation safety inspectors was one of the causes of what happened with, um, with these airplanes. And uh, actually, many of those learnings are uh, quite inspirational for us in pharmacovigilance. Even though it's just rules-based automation, uh, it's so complex and there are thousands and thousands of factors that have been automated. You know, uh, in, in these planes, there are, there's more than 100 computers that interoperate. And it's, it's uh, actually behaving in such a complex fashion that uh, the pilots really feel that they are kind of uh, dealing with the, <laughs> with, with, with the system that has its own uh, will and its own kind of a behavior, uh, which uh, actually also changed the way how pilots are operating today. Uh, when you are flying such a sophisticated and automated aircraft, the role of the pilot has changed from flying it to mostly monitoring and observing. Yeah, but the humans, as we all know, are quite poor monitors because they are vulnerable to fatigue, distraction, boredom, complacency, illness, stress, uh, all of that, of course, negatively impact concentration. <clears throat> it was recognized a number of times. The last time in 2012, uh, where there was a, quite a comprehensive report uh, from European uh, Safety uh, Aviation <clears throat> uh, Authority uh, that uh, actually directly addressed the, uh, the design and training principles for automation policy. It all comes back to this simple performance triangle, man-machine system. Um, uh, this, this is well known in management science for many decades. And uh, of course, in pharmacovigilance, we have used that as well in a couple of guidelines. As, a, as an inspiration, how we should actually describe the pharmacovigilance systems and its interplay between the procedures, design, and competencies that uh, determines the system performance overall. Uh, and the competence is uh, mainly human competence. Um, in, on this picture, it's experience, education, and training. The competence models uh, today are talking about the skills knowledge and attitudes and actually all of that is recognized in here as well. <clears throat> uh, that report uh, from EASA uh, highlighted uh, a couple of automation issues that I believe might actually represent a good lessons for us. Uh, so first one is that the basic manual and cognitive flying skills tend to decline because of that lack of practice and feel for the aircraft. Um, if pilots are actually relying on automation and flying most of the time on autopilot, <clears throat> basically what you don't do regularly, you are just losing them, that competence. I, I see that happening in pharmacovigilance, of course, everywhere. Um, uh, uh, if you are joining as a medical doctor uh, and used to be a clinician, of course, your clinical competence is deteriorating because you are not doing it uh, while doing pharmacovigilance. So even though that you, you might have been quite a big uh, advantage to the company and contributing new uh, clinish, cl clinical point of view into the pharmacovigilance processes and decision making and assessment, uh, over time, of course, that is deteriorating. Uh, there, there are unexpected uh, automation behaviors from the, from the airplanes. 
Um, obviously, we see errors in computer printouts in queries. Uh, I have seen it a number of times, even in with validated systems that you just cannot trust <laughs> the printout. Uh, you need to verify everything. Um, the pilots can be easily distracted from flying the aircraft because the automation actually preoccupies them. Uh, again, we see that with the, even with the simple example of this proportionality analysis. When you give even astute uh, clinicians uh, reaction monitoring printouts that are kind of sorted according to PRRs or other disproportionality analysis, it distracts them. In fact, it's not that helpful because what you expect from these people is a different point of view than just the disproportionality. Um, and that's exactly what's happening with the pilots as well. <clears throat> Uh, flight crews may spend too much time trying to understand actually what's going on. Uh, diagnostic systems are extremely limited, so you might, uh, you know, you might not be able to recognize situations where you need to go beyond the standard operating procedures. And believe me, pilots have hundreds of standard operating procedures and checklists that they need to go through uh, when they are flying these advanced aircrafts. Uh, but the captain has uh, authority in emergency situation to go beyond. But they need to recognize that situation to, to actually go beyond uh, what is in the SOPs. Um, it's difficult to understand sometimes uh, what's, what's going on with the aircraft when automation disconnects <clears throat> and uh, whether actually manual override is is uh, needed. It induces peaks of workload and of stress, and that actually may lead to fatal errors. Uh, we have that in pharmacovigilance too with the business continuity situations. Uh, so that peaks of workload and stress can lead to errors, certainly does lead to errors, and not always we, uh, we, we react optimally. Um, a similar topic is with the transition to degraded modes of automation. Uh, data entry errors, all of us are uh, familiar with that. Even probably when you are uh, uh, driving a car and using a navigation system and just uh, entering earnestly the destination. <clears throat> so just imagine when the, something like that happens with the airplane, when you are programming your flight plan and making an error that uh, may lead to a fatal crash. Uh, unfortunately, the intelligence is not there to alarm you uh, for that. So then there needs to be a lot of uh, checks and balances introduced. The alarms that are built in are just sounding alarm. It does not tell you what's wrong and how to deal with it. So uh, like that Air France flight uh, out of the Atlantic that crashed into the Atlantic, um, you know, the, the crew heard over 70 times um, the warning of stall, that means that the, the plane is falling down, but they didn't know why, and they didn't have enough time to actually find out. Um, so it killed, of course, everybody on, the, on board as well. Um, gain and regain control when automation reaches its limits of its operations, that's, that's that problem. So you are hearing the alarm, but you need to do a lot of diagnostics to find out what's going on. Um, the, the tasks that are allocated to the pilots and flight crews may fall beyond their capabilities. I must say that I am observing that in pharmacovigilance quite often. <clears throat> Many companies do not have sufficient capabilities actually to deal with the issues that they have in their portfolio. And uh, I'm not sure whether actually our current um, inspection and supervision uh, techniques are actually picking this up. <clears throat> So to address all of these uh, automation issues, a new concept has been introduced called uh, crew resource management. There are six generations of that. And I would say that uh, pharmacovigilance is not now operating probably in the first or second generation. We still see a lot of blame culture in some countries, especially, and in some uh, types of companies. And the second generation, already includes the attitudes and communication and leadership, the stress management. The third generation uh, was introduced in the glass cockpit, and that's probably where we are aiming to reach now in pharmacovigilance. 
So there would be a human machine interface <laughs> issues around the stress and fatigue management. So for instance, the pilots know that there are of course high peak workloads, parts of the flight and low, low workload parts of the flight. So they are kind of, uh, you know, resting and saving the, the cognitive abilities and the energy for those high peaks so that they can actually deal with it, especially with the takeoff and landing parts um and resting in between at the cruise <clears throat> so that is critical for success critical for safety and perhaps it's something that we can actually learn from as well uh, the sixth generation works already with the threat and error management um, and that's actually coming uh, from the learnings uh, that uh, uh, new types of audits have been introduced. They are called LOSA, Line Operation Safety Audits. And I believe that's also a great inspiration that we may think about in pharmacovigilance. It's actually observation of the crew during normal operations. So it's not really an audit that, as we know, that there is an audit visit and we are requesting documents and we are reviewing documents and so on. This is a real live observation of what's actually going on. <clears throat> so just imagine that the pharmacovigilance auditor is just joining your regular signal management meeting and just observing how the team interacts, how do you actually discuss issues, <laughs> right? Um, how do you prepare documents? Um, that's, that's very valuable input. And from that, actually, many learnings uh, stemmed out and uh, improved aviation safety quite significantly. So in conclusion, uh, obviously, there are many lessons. I would highlight just three of here <clears throat> on this slide. First of all, clearly, humans are ir irreplaceable. We can decrease the number of people that are needed for the task but it goes hand in hand with increasing demands on that team that remains, especially the competence part. So that's the simple logic of that performance triangle. When you are you know, increasing resources on one part of the triangle, of course, the balance, if you want to keep the same area under the curve for the performance, you need to balance it out with the other corners of the triangle. <clears throat> and uh, you cannot just replace humans. Uh, that's happening also with the in a military, even with the drones. Obviously, there is a human operator that is supervising the drones. Um, it's never uh, fully autonomous. Uh, people supervising machines must have competence to do so, and must always be empowered to override. I think that's one of the major lessons from the Boeing 737. That actually, even though in theory uh, the pilots should should uh, have been able to override. Actually, they were unsuccessful in overriding. Um, so that is extremely dangerous. Um, and we must always be in that position to be able to override and also know when to override. Uh, so that means that we need to have a competence and understanding what actually machines are doing. And the human factors, um, Clearly, we are now reaching the, the issue that individual weaknesses, uh, you know, there is no one person who can do the full pharmacovigilance. There's just simply nobody in the world who can do the full scope of pharmacovigilance alone. It's really a team effort. And uh, obviously in aviation that has been recognized many, many years ago. Uh, so those individual weaknesses may be compensated by thoughtful team approach. Uh, that starts with the proper team composition, multidisciplinary, but not only in terms of the knowledge and skills, but also in terms of the attitudes, so that team actually collaborates effectively. Uh, so that, and then there is an ongoing training, uh, clear procedures for decision making that are effective, uh, recognition of the cultural issues, and even things like job satisfaction. Um, you may remember that uh, terrible suicide act by a pilot who just took the plane to the, to the mountain uh, full of passengers. And that was a suicide because he was not satisfied on the job. Um, 
you know, probably in pharmacovigilance, we would be able to minimize that risk um, early on, but uh, there might be situations where actually individual failures may lead to a significant harm. And uh, I think the job satisfaction is a very important part of the human factors that we can manage. So with that, uh, thank you very much for your attention and I'm open to your questions. Thank you.